have a Bible, let me invite you to open up to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Hear the words of the living God. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me just interrupt the reading to say, what is that all about? Apart from Christ Jesus, every single one of us were born sinners, and every single one of us acted according to that sinful nature by sinning against God. Therefore, every single one of us were born for condemnation. But God, who must judge sin, is also a loving Father who's provided a way by which we may be forgiven, and that way is Jesus. He, be, he left heaven. He's the Son of God. He left heaven to become a man without ceasing to be God. He left heaven to become a man so that he could live for us, die for us, and rise from the dead for us. And as many as trust in him for salvation, for forgiveness of sins, will be forgiven. And therefore, there is now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Most important question right now, are you in Christ Jesus? Are you trusting in him? Because everything after this won't apply unless you are. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death, speaking of those who are in Christ. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now he tells, what, what difference does this make? For or because to be carnally minded, that is fleshly minded, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why? Because the carnal mind is, at, is enmity, is at war against, is opposed to God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9 says, But you, speaking of those who are in Christ, are not of the flesh, but of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. These are the words of the living God. You can be seated. Well, reviewing what we talked about last week and actually the week before that, there are two kinds of people according to verse 5. If you're looking at your notes, there's the carnally minded, which means fleshly minded, and there are the spiritually minded. Remember, this is about the mind, living the Christian life. God has already done everything for us spiritually. Now we need to get our minds engaged to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. We don't do anything to bring about justification. God has already provided and given us everything for sanctification, but we have a responsibility to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in sanctification. Carnally minded people, according to verse 7, are at enmity against God. They're his enemies. Those who are carnally minded cannot, they, they do not and they cannot be subject to the law of God in verse 8. Why? They can't please God. This is the scripture. In contrast, those who are spiritually minded are at peace with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. We can be and we are subject to the law. And the, and the reason why this is good news is we we are subject to the law because we can be now that we're saved. We've been given new hearts, new natures, new desires, new affections. Those who are spiritually minded as opposed to cannot be pleasing to God, we are pleasing to God. We are pleasing to God. And the result of this, according to verse 6, carnally mindedness leads to what? Death. And not just physical death. That's, believe it or not, that's the easy part. The horrible death is the second death, which is the eternal wrath of God to those who are not in Christ Jesus. But those who are in Christ Jesus, verse 1 says, there is no condemnation. Why? Because he took it all for us. 
To be carnally minded, to be fleshly minded is death. To be spiritually minded results in life and in peace. And just a couple of words about that. The life is not merely eternal life, although it is that, but it's an abundant life. And the peace that we experience because we are in Christ and are spiritually minded, the peace comes because it changes how we think about everything, which changes how, what we do. What we do is driven by what we think. If you want to know what you really believe, look at how you live. Oops. Why is this important? Well, it's there in your notes, because it's a matter of life and death. So let me ask you a question. I'm going to assume that the answer is yes, but we'll find out, or you'll find out. It's not for me to find out. It's for you to find out. Do you want to be spiritually minded? Do you want to be spiritually minded? After what he says here about spiritual mindedness versus carnal mindedness, do you want to be spiritually minded? If so, I challenge you to begin by taking four steps to cultivate spiritual mindedness and the fifth one we're reserving for next time. Do you want to be spiritually minded? Then here's some things you need to do in order to cooperate with the Holy Spirit who's already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. First, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2. He, he's already given us everything. Listen, when, you're not, when you and I, I'll conclude myself, when we're not experiencing what God has given us, it's not because we need to pray for God to give us more. It's we need to pray for God to give us what it takes to cooperate with what he's already given us. Salvation is not ours on an installment plan. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. You've been given the Holy Spirit of God when you were born again who abides in you to do all of the things that we don't have time to say that the that the Word of God says the Holy Spirit does in us. You want those things to happen in your life? Cooperate with Him. You don't cause them to happen, and you can't do them in the strength of your flesh, but He's given you His Spirit. He's given you a new set of affections. This is one of the big difficulties that people have with understanding sanctification. We're not saying we sanctify ourselves by the strength of our flesh. No, we can't. But if we're born again, we've been given new hearts, new affections, new desires. And while justification is strictly God, it's, it's monergistic, meaning it's one-sided. He does it all. Sanctification is synergistic, meaning he provides everything that's necessary, but we need to cooperate. I don't know why it just flashes in my mind, but it does because I have one of those minds. It's filled with flashes. You've heard of lifeguards swimming out through the breakers to get to someone who's flailing and drowning and the person starts fighting the lifeguard and sometimes the lifeguard has to punch them out in order to save them listen the lifeguard already came his name is jesus he's come to us he's given us everything we need to stop resisting him we need to stop uh uh grieving the Holy Spirit by refusing what he's already done for us. I mean, if, if, if I said nothing else today, get that. He's already given us everything we need in Christ and in the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have his word, we have the fellowship of the saints, we have the sacraments, we have all these ordinary means of grace by which we put all this stuff into practice. But the good news that we've just got to get through our heads is that he's already done it all. Well, back to my four steps. Here's the first one. If you really want to cultivate spiritual mindedness, number one, understand that spiritual mindedness is based on a Biblical world view. World views. Somebody once said they're like belly buttons. Everybody has one, but nobody talks about it, which is probably good. <laughs> the reality is when it comes to world views, everyone does have one, but few understand that they have one. Few even know what it means. There's lots of definitions for what a world view is. I like mine. I read about 30 of them. And then I synthesized some of them, which were a paragraph or two long, down into a shorter version, because I need short things to remember. A worldview is this. It's one's, wor it's one's wor 
I'm going to say it right. One's worldview is the lens through which one views, thinks about, evaluates everything. That's pretty short, but I think that's it. And here's the little tag in the end, and it directs how one lives. No matter what you say your worldview is, here's how you know what your worldview is. How do you live? Because that's how that that reveals the truth. That reveals the truth. Some worldviews are, I want to contrast here. Some worldviews are very chaotic and full of contradictions. Others are very organized and integrated. Let me say that again so you can so, let it sink in. Some worldviews are chaotic, they're contradictory. Some are organized and integrated. If they're integrated, it's because it's based on a particular school of thought, whatever that school of thought could be. If it's chaotic, that means there is no particular school of thought, and people are making it up as they go along, and that describes most people. We are this, this sort of cacophony of different ideas and people say, well, I believe this and I believe that. And if they just listen to themselves, you can't believe both of those. They're in contradiction. It's contradictory. It's chaotic. Even if your school of thought that you're following is wrong, at least your, your worldview can be integrated and, and um, makes it be, what's the word I'm looking for? Organized and integrated. People who are um, like evolutionists, materialists. They have, a, they have a worldview that's filled with contradictions when you really get into it, but they have a worldview and they stick to the game plan. Okay, but let's talk about a biblical worldview. What is a biblical worldview? This might come as a shock to you. I just said these words, but I'm going to give it to you again. A biblical worldview views, thinks, evaluates everything through biblical lenses and lives accordingly. This should convict all of us at some level or another. Listen, a biblical worldview is based on what does the Bible say? And here's the thing. The Bible has something to say about everything. Whether directly or indirectly, God doesn't leave anything, any stone unturned. The more we know the scripture, not do we just, we don't not only know the obvious things that God says are, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down, but the more we know the scriptures, we know the principles in the scriptures by which we can reason out and discern what God's will is about things that he doesn't explicitly say. That's why we need to know the Bible. The more one knows, by the way, not just knows, but understands, the more one knows and understands the Bible, the more biblical that one's worldview will be. I, I, I believe this with all my heart. As Christians, in order to have an, a, a worldview that is biblical, we must abandon worldviews that are unbiblical. Why? Because they're in contrast. We also have to abandon worldviews that are just the things that we make up out of our mind. You hear people saying this all the time. Well, I believe, with all due respect, who cares? Who are you? When God has said, thus saith the Lord, when someone else comes along and says, yes, but I believe, well, you're wrong if it's not what God says. It's not, this isn't complicated. That's why I can figure it. So many people's worldviews are just, they're just making it up. Well, my God wouldn't do that. And they claim to be Christians. They claim to believe in the God of the Bible, and yet my God wouldn't do the very things that the God of the Bible does. Because you're still listening to the worldview that came out of a Cracker Jacks box. Um, why do we need to abandon worldviews that are unbiblical or are from our own minds? Because, A, God's word has something to say about every issue of life. You say, well, I don't know about that. You're right, you don't know. You're right, you don't know. It reminds me of archaeology. People say, well, the such and such can't be true. It talks about the Hittites, and there's no, we never found anything about the Hittites. And people wrote books about how the Bible was wrong, and then they dug a little deeper in the sand, and they found this whole civilization of the Hittites. Oops. So when people say, well, I, I don't understand, 
that's right. You don't understand. Keep digging. But dig in the word. Dig in the word. Why do we need to abandon unbiblical worldviews or worldviews that are strictly out of our own minds? Because God's word has something to say about every issue of life. And B, because it doesn't matter what others think. It doesn't matter what we think. It matters what God's word says. That's a biblical worldview. And a lot of you say amen. And some of you saying amen might be saying amen, but you don't believe it. You want to know why? I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You don't know the Bible well enough to know that God has already spoken on that. And to oppose God, well, let's just say that's probably not the wisest choice. A biblical worldview strains out everything through the sieve of God's word. Do you understand what I'm saying? The more you know God's word, the tighter the weave of the sieve. The more junk's going to get exposed. Only the truth will go through. Biblical worldview separates fact from fiction. It separates truth from error. Based on God's inspired, inerrant, and supremely authoritative word. Or as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, bring every thought into the captivity of Christ. Why? For his approval or disapproval. For his approval or disapproval. A biblical worldview rejects the false notion that we have the spiritual or religious aspect of our lives and then we have the rest of our lives. A biblical worldview cannot abide with that. Why? Because if Jesus Christ is Lord at all, he is Lord of all. And every area of your life, God cares about. Biblical worldview rejects these things. A biblical worldview integrates all of life and brings every aspect of our lives under the authority of God's word. Everything from how we worship, which that's an obvious, even though countless Christians say, well, I always thought we should worship with finger painting. That Won't that be in a defense? No. You worship God the way God says. Even Christians get this wrong. They don't even worship according to God's word sometimes. But it The biblical worldview directs how we worship, how we shop. I remember John MacArthur one time saying, he says, when people come in for counseling, this was a long time ago, back when he was probably doing counseling. He'd say, let me look at your check register. That shows how long ago it was. He says, I can tell what your priorities are by where your money goes. Let me look at your check register, and then I'll find out the truth about you. And then they probably wanted to go to a different counselor. How we worship, how we shop, how we work, how we play, and everything else. The Bible says the truth about all these things. Listen, true spiritual mindedness is based on a biblical worldview. Now, that was probably the shortest course on biblical worldview that you've ever heard, uh, but that's all you're going to get today. Because now I'm going to move on to the second thing. First of all, understand that a spirit, the spiritual mindedness is based on a biblical worldview, and you need one. And so do I. Secondly, ask for a spiritual mind. This is so simple. Ask for a spiritual mind. Let me tell you why. You can't do anything in your own strength, much less be spiritual minded. Be spiritually minded. But but the Bible says as believers, we have the mind of Christ. Based on some of the, the decisions that we frequently make. Whoops. But we've been given the mind of Christ that's part of the package deal of being born again. So ask the Holy Spirit to increase your desire to give you the discipline to think spiritually. It's his will. He wants that for us. He's already supplied everything. You don't need to ask him for a biblical mind. You need to ask him to cultivate biblical mindedness. Ask the Holy Spirit, for instance, to guard your mind from wandering and to bring you back to biblical world thinking, worldview thinking when you've strayed. Ask the Holy Spirit to preserve you from discouragement when you find it to be difficult and want to give up. Ask the Holy Spirit to pres- preserve you from spiritual pride when you're really clicking on all cylinders and you think you're really much that much better than everybody around you. James chapter 4, verse 2, you do not have because ask. And again, make Make this. Make sure you get this. I'm not asking 
for more of the Holy Spirit. You, he didn't come piecemeal. Not asking for more of the Holy Spirit, not asking for uh, more of his blessings. He's already provided everything that you need for, the, for life abundantly in Christ. What we need to ask is the Holy Spirit for these other things that I've just mentioned. Ask. You must ask because it is only by his Spirit and by his grace that you'll make any progress towards biblical world-mindedness, spiritually-mindedness. Here's a fourth one. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Here's a third one. Somebody got excited. Oh, we skipped one. <laughs> well, don't get too excited. Three and four are both quite short. Here's the first of those two. Number three, be willing to turn off the lies and turn up the truth. This is what we talked about last time at some length, so I'm not going to go back over it. Go back and watch or listen to last week's message. But let me ask you, so, ask you a question. Are you willing to deny yourself popular worldly influences? If you want a spiritual mind, you've got to be willing to deny yourself popular worldly influences, and I'm not going to define them. We did that last week. But ask yourself, am I willing to deny myself popular world influences, and am I willing to discipline myself in the power of the Spirit who is indwelling me? Am I willing to discipline myself to feed my mind with more Scripture? Because that's what it takes. I'm going to spider web here for just a minute. Some people think it's once we're saved, it's all up to us to live a Christian life. That's legalism. Other people go completely to the other end of the spectrum and adopt something that they don't even know what it's called. Why should anybody? But I do because I study this stuff. So I got to show off that I went to school. It's called quietism. Quietism is better known as let go and let God. I'm just going to sit in my easy chair and do nothing and wait for the Holy Spirit to change me. No, he's already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, so cooperate with the Holy Spirit so your sanctification will be making progress. If you just run up the white flag and say, well, I'm going to continue to sin unless the Lord changes me, he has. You are not that old person any longer. You are a new person in Christ. Otherwise, just tear out several pages of the book of Romans. Those who are not willing to make progress, those who are not willing to do this, will not make progress towards being spiritually minded. You've got to be willing to turn off the noise of the lies of this world and say no to the flesh. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself. Well, I want to wait for the Holy Spirit to deny myself. No, you need to deny yourself in the power of the Holy Spirit who is in you. It's his spirit, it's his power, but we have a stake in it. We have a responsibility. Here's the fourth one. Think spiritually intentionally. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit more time with this last one. You might be looking at your watch and say, you don't have any more time. I look at my watch and say, you got nothing but time. <laughs> I say you need to think spiritually intentionally, as is the case with anything else you learn and hope to do well. Did you, anything that you've learned, did you, did you learn it by not trying? Something as simple as tying your shoes. How many times did they end up in knots and your mother had to untie them for you? Or unless you're modern, you just had Velcro. But the point is, everything we do takes effort. Did you, did you finish your advanced degrees by doing nothing? then your degree is probably not worth much. Everything that we've learned that matters, we had to think, give sp specific thought to. Does that make sense? You got you to gotta concentrate. You got to pay attention. I tell you, one of the most important things my father ever said to me, he said a lot of funny things, but this one was just right to it. He goes, get with it, son. Oh, okay. We need to get with it. We must deliberately take time to exercise our minds to think spiritually. It is only as we have, now listen to what I'm saying here, it's only as we take certain times, specific times, I'm not talking about specific hours of the day, that's not important, but that we take time. It's only 
as we take time to think spiritually that we will learn to take that we will learn to think spiritually all the time it's only as we take specific time to think spiritually that we will learn to think spiritually all of the time and i haven't made it to the end of that and i'm in good company because the apostle paul says not that i've already attained but i'm pressing forward you don't just wake up one day and start thinking spiritually. Even as a Christian, you've got all the gear, you've got all the, everything you need, you've got all the gear, all the equipment, all the ammo, whatever you think it is you need, he's given it to you. But you've got to learn to use it all by, by using it deliberately. I'm going to give you several examples of things that I have found to be helpful. Some of these you've heard before. Some of you are already doing them. Praise God. Here's the first one. It's one of the most simple things is have a daily quiet time. Have a daily quiet time with the Lord in which you read through the Bible. We talked about this last week. I won't go into great detail again. You need to read through the Bible. You need to meditate on what you read and you need to pray. Read the whole Bible over and over and over again. You're never done reading the Bible until you're dead or you can't in any way take it in. But believe me, I saw a man who read the Bible every day, chapters and chapters, and when he couldn't see, we got him a tablet so we could get letters this big, and pretty soon he couldn't see that either. And I said, what about an audio Bible? I don't think I could do that. Well, we got him set up with an audio Bible, and after a couple of days he loved it, and he was doing 25-plus chapters a day because he wanted the Word of God. It's my dad. No excuses. Blindness. Read the Bible. Read it today. Read it tomorrow. Read it the next day. And never stop. Have a daily quiet time. And by the way, just as a footnote to last week, read the Bible. Devotionals are great, but never instead of the Bible. Never instead of the Bible. Here's the second one. Participate in church every week. Notice the word participate. It doesn't say attend. The, churches, the, the chairs in the church are here every week, and they are not thinking spiritually. you got to do more than show up. Participate, not just attend. Engage your mind by coming consistently. Engage your mind by arriving expectantly. Engage your mind by participating attentively. Engage your mind by when you come in here, pray longingly, God, speak to me. Our God is a God who speaks to us. Give me ears to hear what the Spirit says. Pray for that. And by the way, I say every week. Notice I didn't say every Sunday. I'm going to give you a footnote that is not in the Bible, but this is my opinion. I don't know how anybody can live on one worship service a week. It's just me. Number three, spend time meditating on key subjects. This is what we're saying. We're practicing doing this intentionally so that we can learn and have a, a foundation on which to do this by default. The more you do this, the more it'll become a part of your thought processes. At first, it may seem like, oh, this is scary. Yeah. Yeah. I know this is like talking about learning to drive a buckboard. But when I learned to drive a stick shift, remember those? <laughs> I couldn't get anybody in my family to teach me. Um, and then I found out later they were afraid of being with me. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Meditating on key subjects intentionally. Um, I didn't put these in the bulletin because I didn't figure anybody would want to read them, and I didn't want the outline to be five pages long. If you want to read later what I'm going to read to you now, there's a stack of these on the communion table. Come and get them. Here's the first one. Here's four topics. Meditate on heaven. That's A. Meditate on heaven. I, I learned this from reading John Owen. He was a 7th cent, 17th century English Puritan. He wrote a book 
who wrote a lot of books, a lot, a lot, a lot of books. He wrote a book called The Grace and Duty of Being Spiritually Minded. Wouldn't you think that's a great place to start? Let me see if I can read what he said. I want you to, don't, don't count, but just notice how many times he mentions spiritual mindedness or thinking. Spiritual mindedness is heavenly mindedness. Faith will grow stronger by thoughts about heaven. The more, believe, the more believers think about heaven, the more they will look forward to being there. Those who do not think of heaven frequently do not think of it sincerely. That's a challenge. Imagine a group of people on a journey to a country where they expect to live well. Some of them know very little about that country. Others have, been used, have used every means to learn about it. Because the journey is difficult and wearisome, maybe even dangerous, the people who know little of their destination easily despair and give up. But those who have a clear idea of where they are going, they have strength to endure to the end. Thus, being familiar with thoughts about heaven makes believers strong to endure hardship and persecution. Spiritual mindedness gets you through. Another advantage arising from frequently thinking about heaven, says Owen, is that we will be less likely to have a wrong love for earthly things. I'm not thinking here of those who desire nothing more than to amass wealth in this life. No one ever pretends those people are spiritually minded. <laughs> I'm thinking of those who gain their wealth in lawful and honest ways and who live in a moderate way. There is nothing wrong in all that they do, yet sometimes they sometimes are asked to be excused from helping charitable causes because they have their own families to care for. They may ask to be excused from taking on responsibilities at church because their interests take so much of their time. Of course, I'm not suggesting that believers should neglect their families or their businesses. Of course not. What is expected of them would not, and in fact, deprive them or their families of any necessary support, nor damage their businesses. But being satisfied with these excuses, they demonstrate that their priority is this life, not the next. It's sad to see believers who will talk freely about spiritual things and behave in Christian ways and yet who decline to be involved in spiritual duties even though such duties will cost them uh, will not cost them 1% of their earthly enjoyments. Whenever our love, listen to this, whenever our love for this world by apparently reasonable arguments takes away our fear lest we should love it too much, then we are wait for it, less spiritually minded. Again, I know that's a lot to take to just listen to. Help yourself to one of these. And if we run out, we have a copy machine. So to remember, the point is, remember to think about what heaven is. And I would add this, think of what heaven truly is, not the false imagination of those who think heaven is a place where people become angels. I can't believe how many Christians, oh, I know he's up there looking down on us. No, he's not. If he's in heaven, his eyes are on Jesus. It wouldn't be heaven to look down here and look at us. <laughs> it's heaven to be looking at Jesus. Heaven is not a place where dead people become angels, and heaven is not a place where we can experience earthly delights on a higher level. Oh, I can't wait to get to heaven because then football will be seven days a week. I just pick on football because it's just the first one that came to mind. There's nothing in my notes about that. It was not a premeditated slam. It was off the cuff. It could be anything. It could be tiddlywinks. It could be school. It could be anything. Heaven is heaven because God is there and sin is not. That's the draw of heaven. Yes, we'll be reunited with our loved ones, and that will be glorious. But heaven is heaven because God is there and because sin is not. Here's a second topic. Meditate on the attributes of God. I'm going to share a brief reading by A.W. Tozer. He was a 20th, 20th century preacher and writer. I would heartily recommend the book, Knowledge of the Holy. It is a paperback book. It is, an, it is not a difficult read at all. And yet, if you will meditate on what he 
guides you through thinking about God, you're going to be practicing spiritual thinking. The low view of God entertained almost universally among Christians is the cause of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us. A whole new philosophy of the Christian life has resulted from this one basic error in our religious thinking, with our loss of the sense of the majesty has come the further loss of religious awe and consciousness of the divine presence. We have lost our spirit of worship and our ability to withdraw inwardly to meet God in adoring silence. Modern Christianity is simply not producing the kind of Christian who can appreciate or experience the life in the Spirit. The only way to recoup our spiritual losses is to go back to the cause of them and make such corrections as the truth warrants. The decline of the knowledge of the holy has brought on our troubles. A rediscovery of the majesty of God will go a long way towards curing this. If we would bring back spiritual power to our lives, we must begin to think about God more nearly as he truly is. The truth about God Learn about and meditate on his attributes. Get the book. It's a great place to begin. See on your outline, meditate on Christ. Just spend time thinking about the beauty of Christ. Of course, the word is going to be your guide in this. Again, I quote from John Owen speaking about spiritual thinking. It is important to think about Christ in a biblical way. Nothing in the Bible suggests that we must have a crucifix to make us think about him. No, duh. Read some passage of Scripture that teaches something about Christ and think about it. It's not that hard. We should think about Christ's glory in heaven now as a wonderful person, both divine and human, his prayers for his church that cannot fail. When his church is complete, we will see the glory of his coming to judge the world. Spiritual meditation on these things is not merely to recite facts to ourselves. Spiritual mindedness means we have a sense of delight in these things. Thinking about the eternal glories of Christ will be the best way to endure the troubles of life. The many other ways by which people try to help themselves to face trouble is sort of like a medicine which relieves pain temporarily and then leaves us in the same state we were in before. There is only one source of comfort. Here it is. When the mind is filled with thoughts of the unseen glories of eternity in Christ. See, we get, to, we get to the place where we're thinking about Christ sort of as default as we think about these things on purpose. Let me give you one more. This is from a, a, an author from even longer ago. His name is Paul. Here's D, meditate on the worthlessness of self-righteousness. Write that down, the worthlessness. Meditate on the worthlessness of self-righteousness and the glory of Christ's righteousness. This is the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 20. I'm not going to read it to you. I'm just going to give you these notes. I encourage you to go back and meditate on this passage and don't miss these points. In verses 4 through 6, Paul remembered how he used to value his own righteousness. He trusted in it. He thought it was enough. I used to boast in these things. Verses 7 through 9, Paul counted all of those things as Worse than valueless, they were things that needed to be disposed of, like so much manure. Verses 12 through 14, Paul did not consider himself to have arrived, so he was pressing on. Even he hadn't arrived, but he was pressing on. In verses 15 and 16, Paul exhorts us to aspire to have 
this kind of spiritual mind, he says very specifically in those verses, have this mind. It's about thinking correctly. Verse 17 through 19, Paul calls us to follow his example, not the example of those who set their minds on earthly things. He specifically says, don't follow the people who love this world. Those are not the people to follow. I won't even mention the word celebrities. And why do these things, according to verse 20? Because our citizenship is in heaven. It's not on this earth. Do you agree? Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? Think about heaven. If we desire to be spiritually minded, we need to train our minds by deliberately meditating on spiritual truth at a conscious level. We need to do this at least a few times each week to start with. And the longer you do it, the more you'll want to do it. So we'll pick up next time with how do we make the transition from consciously thinking of spiritual things to how does that cause it to be a, become a default to where spiritual things are what we think of, even when we are engaged in other activities that we must be engaged in, like our work and our school, etc. Let me pray. Father, we don't want to be those who are carnally minded because it leads to death. We want to be those who are spiritually minded because it leads to life and peace. Father, we acknowledge that your word declares over and over and over again that Jesus has already won everything for his people. All that we need for lives of godliness is ours in Christ. May we acknowledge that we simply need to learn to avail ourselves of what you have given us, what Christ died to provide for us. And Father, may we not be afraid of a little hard work, because it is mental work, but it is work. May we, dis- may we long to hear your word. May we long to read your word. May we long to think according to your word. And may we practice thinking about lofty spiritual truths. And as we find ourselves as Christians being delighted in these things, may we not be able to wait until we can come back for more. And we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for it. Forgive us for our dullness. Forgive us when we have everything that we're so easily distracted by a whole lot of nothing. And we pray it in faith, believing what your word says. Amen. Mm-hmm.